I really wanted Dr. Tanjia to be on with me, so I started it over again. So let's see if she can get on now. Let's see. I sure hope she can. And I thank you guys for bearing with me. I just think it's important for her to be on here for this discussion. Okay, let's see. It doesn't say I have viewers yet. It doesn't say I have any viewers yet. So let's see if we can get some viewers on here. Um... Yes, it's definitely Minority Mental Health Month. Hello, hello. We're trying to get uh, Dr. Coleman on here. She's not here yet. Let's see, let's see. Girl, if you don't come on here, it said just adding you. I hope this go through. It says it's adding you. But this is about to drive me nuts. Come on, come on. It says it's doing it. It's blinking. I'm waiting. Hello, everyone. If you're here, you're here in honor of Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, where we're talking about HR perspectives on mental health with our special guest, my co-host. I'm adding her right now, but it's taking a little longer than I thought <laughs> to get her to bring her on here. Hello, hello. Oh, it says she hasn't answered my request to join. You have to answer my request to join. You have to um, add. You have to accept the ad to join the live video. We're gonna get her on here um, if possible. I'm messaging her right now so that we can really talk about this this month. This is our third try. I say three, three tries is a charm. It says it's adding her. It, it's, it's not saying that. Oh, it's saying it's failed. So I can't get her on. This is driving me nuts today. Now it says she's not even here. So I, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to try this again. Okay. So when she comes, she's, she's doing another setup. Um, and so we're, we're going to just keep going. Um, so for those of you who are new to this discussion, I am Dr. Key. Um, I have been doing a couple segments this month for Minority Mental Health Month, which is so, so, so important right now. And today we're going to talk about the, the HR view of, of minority mental health considerations and things that we should be thinking about, things that are going on right now um, with employers and employees and varied populations. We're really going to talk about Black women and mental health as well and how that can impact us in the workplace. If you was here last month, you know I did a discussion on anxiety in the workplace. Um, and our discussion was very, very good. It was a good discussion. 
but we talked about um, ways to sort of treat anxiety through exercise and some of the types of foods that we eat. And we had a special guest on at that time. Um, and today, um, Dr. Tanjia will be on, and she's going to talk about from the, the, the HR perspective, some of the things that we don't utilize um, that we should be utilizing as a part of our workplace. So hopefully she does join us, but until then, we're going to keep going because we've, we've started a couple times already. Um, and, I, and I don't see her just yet, but I'm, I'm watching, I'm keeping, I'm keeping eye. I can add her now, so I'm going to try to add her, and hopefully I can have her introduce herself. Um, so you have to select the camera because um, it says that I'm adding you to video. It says it's connecting. Ah! Are we here? Can you hear me? Seems like we have a little bit of a slow connection. Can you hear? We do see you. Can you hear? She's here. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? With technology, but we can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear, can you me? hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? But can you hear me? I need you to hear me. I can hear you. You can? Yes. I hear you and I see you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Welcome, you welcome. can hear and see me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Can you I, can, introduce yourself? I can hear you. Good. Well, can you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Can you introduce yourself? Did you hear that? Hi, my name is uh, Dr. <laughs> Tanja Coleman, and I am an organization culture expert, and I've worked for Fortune 100 companies as well as nonprofits and uh, startups. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hi, Kelly. Uh, Hi, Tracy M. How are you? People. See, some of your people are here to talk with us today. So I'm glad you're here. I, it took three, time, three times to really get you um, on, but we are so glad Hello. that you are here. Um, and people are waving at you and saying hello. So um, can you, if you, can you hear me clearly? Okay, so what I want to talk about is that 70% of people who are currently employed, that they're searching for another job. So, I mean, people aren't happy at their current employers. And I would... I can hear you. Yeah, I would say that they're not happy at their current employers because maybe about 50% of them are having some stress issues, some things that are challenging their mental health and they don't feel supported. Um, and so I think that this discussion is very timely for us. Um, I did some research and I found that uh, mental health, like healthy workplaces that support healthy mental health, um, they have productive atmospheres, they give people a good living wage, they provide reasonable accommodations. Um, they support health and wellness in their environment. I even heard that some government agencies are giving people three hours a week 
to work out with a trainer or work out on site in their gym. So the trainer's on site and the gym is on site. I think that's amazing. But so healthy environments have open communication, accountability on both the employee and the manager's end, and a great work-life balance. And so many of us don't have this in our workplaces, right? And so it impacts our mental health negatively. You know, when we talked about anxiety amongst women, um, a lot of it was associated with stress in the workplace. So it, our discussion is just timely. So I wanted to get your feedback on some of that, on what you think about um, the workplace and, and the stress and, and what you see in the HR perspective of it. But let me read this quote first. The strong black woman trope is far more harmful than many of us stop to consider. And that was from Ja'Cory Holder. Basically saying that this holding on to this idea of being a strong black woman is really preventing us and it's hurting our mental health and it's standing in the way for us seeking help. So if you can add to this discussion um, from your perspective being in HR, that would be very helpful. It might be a little bit of a delay. Absolutely. And um, really, I approach this from just uh, an organizational issue as, as well as um, African American females. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everyone yes. hear? Yes, yes. Yes. Can everyone hear? Yes. Dr. Key, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure. So really, um, I wanted to say, I look at, I look, look at the organization from just um, a, an African-American issue, female issue, but also just organizationally in general. So um, as far as employee assistance program, really is considered a success from or, uh, EAP vendors if they have a 5% utilization rate of their services. However, that's in stark contrast to really when we look at the data around um, trauma. So most individuals, 70% of adults have had some form of exposure to trauma. So if you think of that seven in 10 adults that have had exposure to trauma, most of those individuals are working in the workplace, yet we only have a 5% utilization rate at best. That's a best case scenario for organizations and for employees utilizing those services. And most of the time, I find uh, from an HR perspective that many of our employees are not fully utilizing the services that are available. Most organizations offer at a minimum three visits with a mental uh, wellness professional uh, at no charge. Most companies now, yeah. because there's a lot of external societal trauma that's happening, are increasing that from anywhere to 5 to 7%, particularly in cases where you have employees that are dealing with vicarious trauma. So they're dealing with other folks' trauma and carrying that baggage with them. So they absolutely need additional care and the opportunity to unload some of that emotional baggage. So what mm -hmm. we see in the workplace really is a byproduct of all of our childhood trauma, right? And all of the experiences that, experiences that we've had as children, um, along with domestic violence. So oftentimes we see that in the workplace as well. Um, employees should know that there are certain laws, state laws, federal laws that, that do protect you and support you if you have been or are currently the victim of any type of domestic violence. Um, I think as fellow peers, colleagues, leaders, managers, we need to look out for those signs. If we see a drastic change in someone's personality, attitude, habits, you can certainly 
um, support that individual without being overly intrusive, but always making them aware of what services um, they can utilize and what services the organization provide to help support them through traumatic instances. Yes, I agree. And I want to dig into like why people don't utilize EAP. And first, I'm going to start with Black culture perspective. Statistically, we know. Also, um, when we think of workplace culture, there's a lot. We can... mm-hmm. I think your uh, volume just went out. Your volume went out for a second. So I, I think that. from that perspective, it, it kind of it, it's a it's a broader cultural dynamic to that that really talks about mental health and mental wellness in general, right? And, mm. Okay. Yes. So um, there is across if you if we're referencing specifically african american culture and why individuals don't use eap programs and mental uh wellness programs as much as they should and culturally there's a stigma towards that and i think also you know as african american women we are always kind of taught and raised to be very strong to be very independent not to rely on anyone, not to have to depend on anyone. And also there is a culture of um, confidentiality. You keep your business to yourself. You don't discuss it Mm -hmm. with external sources, whether they're professional or non-professional. You really hold on Mm -hmm. to a lot of trauma, a lot of things that are happening with you that other people could absolutely provide you guidance, provide you support. Um, and just listening and understanding, being empathetic, giving you resources. But in, in the African-American community, it's highly thought that you keep information to yourself and you don't seek outside help because that is a sign of weakness and it's a yeah. sign that you can't uh, manage your life. And so yeah. until that stigma uh, starts to diminish and go away, which I do think... Um, Little by little, that rock is being chipped away at because I do feel like more people are reaching out for professional help um, and getting that support that they need. And um, one of my previous leaders said, everyone should be seeking some type of mental health wellness, (laughs) whether you feel Mm -hmm. like you need it or not. You should certainly talk to someone at least on a quarterly basis because we all have things that either happen to us that are happening to others around us that we have yeah. to shoulder, whether it's dealing with chronic illness for ourselves, our friends are dealing with it, our family, uh, uh, individuals that are dealing, in, particularly in Chicago, uh, with a high incident of murder or um, traumatic incidences with law enforcement and et cetera. So yeah. there's a lot that's going on where people really need that support. And from an HR perspective, it all comes into the workplace. And it manifests itself in different ways. And you start to see the different leadership styles and how people are trying to deal with it. And oftentimes it comes out um, in the workplace in a myriad of different ways. And I can kind of walk you through some of those um, styles. Okay. Well, I have one question before we get into the styles, because I think that's important. I just wanted to add that one of the stigmas with utilizing EAP is that my supervisor, my job, they're going to know all my business and it's going to work against me. Um, and so people are not open to using EAP because it's through the employer and it's actually connected to the job, but it's not connected in a way where they can share that information. Can you speak to why they cannot share that information? Because I know about HIPAA, but I really think we need to demystify some of the myths that we have about utilizing services through our employers. They're free, they're for us, they're available, but we're not utilizing it because we think that 
people are going to find out our truth, whatever's wrong with us. Okay, I couldn't really hear your question. <laughs> um, so I heard something about therapy. Right. And I talked about, um, talked about it in terms of people thinking that... So what was it about therapy? Yeah, just thinking that people believing that their employer is going to find out what happens in therapy, what happens through treatment. So talking about HIPAA and how HIPAA prevents. So are you asking about, are you asking about employees that utilize EAP and feel like their employers might find out the information about it? Yes. Yes. We have a delay, so I think the delay is preventing you from hearing me. But yes. Okay. So uh, just how EAP programs work and the confidentiality around it is they do not um, divulge any personal information on any particular employee or give out any data points relative to why that employee called um, or what any specifics or detail around that employee's conversation and who they spoke to. Um, so it's, it, it is important to know that piece and I, and perhaps that is one of the reasons why utilization tends to be lower amongst employees because they do feel like there might be a breach of their confidentiality. It's absolutely not. I can say from an HR perspective, what data is aggregated and provided to us is really just a utilization rate. So what percentage of employees are actually using the program? They don't get into specifics of if someone called for mental health, wellness, if someone called for um, financial guidance and information, they really, if you call that 800 EAP number, they are really tallying how many employees have called that number. They don't calculate who, they don't try to determine who it is or determine uh, what the person in particular was calling for. They're really just saying, okay, our, your EAP, a uh, hotline number was utilized X percent or X amount of times, but not any detailed data as to why you called. Good. That is great. Great. We needed to share that because people really think that their boss is going to know all their business. So thank you for sharing that. So can you talk to us about leadership styles then that may impact mental health in the workplace? I hope hopefully you can hear me. Leadership styles. We have this delay, so it takes a minute. And can you guys who are listening, can you hear us both? I know the uh, doctor is on a... Okay, Dr. Key, doing? what was your question? Just the leadership styles that impact mental health. I don't think she can hear me. We're about an hour difference, and I think that's sort of impacting our, our um, communication. No, I can't. What was your question again? You're kind of going in and out. So what I'd like to talk about, too, um, as part of um, the mental wellness of employees is certainly around leadership and um, communication styles. And so one of the things that um, manifests itself in the workplace is all these different leadership and peer relationship styles. Um, and I've come up with some, some uh, names for them that you all are probably familiar with and you may have seen displayed in your workplace as well. And one is um, the passive aggressive individual. This is a person that agrees with whatever your perspective is or whatever your direction is to your face, but they actively um, do things to chip away at whatever you're trying to achieve because they don't wholeheartedly believe in it, but they never told you so. And 
this type of individual in terms of how to work with them is to really have one-on-one -on -one personalized conversation with them that makes it a safe place for them to authentically view um, and express their opinion. The other leadership style, and I'll go through these because I know um, you all have other things to do, but you can always uh, email me at reimagineod at gmail.com for further information is the bully. And we've all witnessed the bully, right? Um, it's the bull in the China shop. They over talk you, they're louder, and they might even get up and physically overshadow you so you feel intimidated. And the best way I find to um, deal with a bully is to just deal with them head on and to ask them if they're out of their seat to please have a seat and <laughs> to really just have direct communication with them and let them know you're not intimidated. And that usually squashes the bully's power over you. Um, the people pleaser, once again, is someone who um, tries to please everyone. They take on projects that um, are not no one else wants to do and they feel like that will help them get a leg up in the organization or have people like them and generally it doesn't it's another form of abuse that stems from childhood trauma from people who've been exploited as children and that's the way it manifests itself in the workplace um, the accountability avoider is what you often refer to as a finger pointer, right? That finger's pointing everywhere but to them around why things didn't get done, um, why there's conflict. They don't take accountability for their actions, their yeah. performance or the outcomes of their work. Mm -hmm. And then you have kind of that pants on fire peer or leader who waits until the very last minute to do things. Uh -huh. And then everyone else should... Uh, their, their stalling and procrastination becomes everyone else's emergency. Yeah. And that's a, the way you work with that type of person is if you're on a project with them, you create a project plan and meet with them weekly to make sure that they're holding up their end of the bargain so that you're not running around with your pants on fire when it's two days from being due or it's overdue. And then uh, the idea hijacker, I think we've all had those individuals as well we work with who kind of take your idea and uh, present it as their own. And one of the ways to deal with the hijacker is to always have your ideas written down, send them out ahead of time so that you are sure to get credit for the work and the ideas and your visions that you are um, developing and creating. Yeah. And so I talked a lot about communication around leadership styles. And one of the things that I think is a really great best practice to have is establish your rules of engagement for email communications and then a separate rules of engagement for meetings. And this really set the standard and protocol for what is viewed as allow, um, viewed as fitting into your, your value system as an organization and as a team in terms of how you will engage one another, what type of conversation you will have, um, and what's expected on both ends. And so one of the rules of engagement um, in meetings is that people be active and present, that they're not on their computers when you're talking to them, um, that they speak in a respectful tone, that they wait until the one person completes their thought and statement prior to interjecting or stepping in and that people speak with one another with respect and dignity and allow that person um, to have pride throughout that conversation. And I think that sets the tone for some of these leadership styles that I talked about um, diminishing. Also around the email rule of engagement you, you want your emails to be able to talk about a set of facts, um, also to have in that email um, an overtone of respect and dignity and following the values and mission of the organization in terms of how you communicate to one another. It shouldn't be any different in, in an email than a phone conversation, but oftentimes I find people via email really find their inner jerk and they can be very curt and rude. Um, and so you have to sort of have those rules of engagement um, set up with your team and your peers. If you don't have something like that set up, um, I would suggest you create it 
If you are stumbling on how to create it, you can certainly feel free to work, uh, reach out to Dr. Key or myself, and we can certainly help you work that out and provide a template for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is very helpful. Um, I, I would think that the different types of leadership definitely impact the stress within that environment and how we internalize our communication. Um, I've heard people, you know, get stressed out over email and really sort of are paranoid by the email. And it causes that anxiety and stuff because of the communication style. So I think this is so important. Um, so thank you for explaining the different communication styles. I think all of us know some bullies. All of us know some individuals who wait till the last minute to do things and we're supposed to be collaborating together. <laughs> um, and so how to manage and how to work with them is important. But one thing that you said was the rules of engagement in which we need to establish. But how does an employee take on a role of how to establish rules of engagements for communication within themselves when they're the employee and not, you know, the director or the person or the supervisor or the person is in charge. They're on the receiving end of maybe a bully who communicates very direct or maybe a person who refuses to uh, meet with them. How can they sort of change the tone to have a more positive conversation. And I really hope you can hear me. Hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> I, we do have a delay. Can you hear me? I, 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 we have a delay, so I'm gonna make sure that she can hear my question. Are you there? Can you hear me? I'm typing, guys, because I think that sometimes she can't hear my question. You can hear me? I'm glad it's informative. Thank you. We have a little bit of delay, and I know she's an hour behind me. I'm in a hotel, so that may be contributing to the delay as well. So I sent her um, a message, so hopefully she can. Hello, hello. So I, don't, I don't think she hears me. Are you there? Can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you now. Oh, it went out for a minute. I had asked, how does an employee initiate rules of engagement with a supervisor? And I typed it at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see it. You hear me when I say hello, but you don't hear me when I ask the question. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> you there? Her, her phone just went out. I hope you guys are getting some information. I think you guys can probably hear us simultaneously, but there is a small delay where she um, can't hear my responses to a little bit, but it's a little choppy. But I hope that you all are getting a good understanding of what we're saying about all the different things that leads to um, mental health challenges in the workplace. But I think one of the most important things, besides talking about ways of communication and leadership, one of the most important things to really discuss is the fact that we should be utilizing EAP, just like we utilize tuition assistance, um, conference um, travel, all of these things that we utilize in our workplace. But when it comes to our mental wellness, we don't want to utilize the service that is offered because we think 
that um, that information is going back to our employer and it's going to be some stigmas attached to that. And actually, that service is a free service. EAP is free. Many employers have anywhere between three and seven, just three and seven, just to recap what she said, um, three and seven sessions for free, for absolutely for free. And they actually find you a counselor or social worker or licensed mental social worker or something to work with you. They'll even work with you with health and all kinds of finances, just all kinds of things. And we are not utilizing this service, but our employers are paying for it. And I think we need to get away from that stigma if we want to be healthy. I mean, we need to take our own mental health, our own mental health, <laughs> take control of it, okay? And we need to utilize it, period. We need to utilize it. Yes. And she said she had a great point that communication is key. Um, and I'm going to try to bring her back on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just adding her again. But communication is key. And understanding, I think also understanding our leadership communication style is key. Wouldn't you agree that we need to know the communication style that is within our environment? I think she's, she's here. Absolutely. I think it's... I think it's really important to understand that and also know what works for you and what doesn't. There are just certain work cultures that tend to be more aggressive in nature, that tends to be more service oriented in nature, um, that seems to be more collaborative or work independently. And you have to really understand and figure out what works best for you because um, not every work organization or work culture is going to align with how you like to work. Now, with that said, oftentimes we're in a situation where we, we are comfortable, we have a certain leader, our culture is uh, what we expect it to be, and all of a sudden your leader changes, right? Your leader gets promoted, your leader decides to leave the organization, and you have to coalesce to an entirely new style. And one of the best ways to do that when, you first, when you're initially engaging with a new leader is to really find out what their management style is like. How do they like to receive communication? How frequently? And then what you can do to help make the, pos make the relationship a positive working one. And I always say, you know, for individuals who are thinking of joining organizations, um, it's really imperative that you ask about the workplace culture, about the workplace culture. You might be told a lot of things that are super positive, but the way to really get to the, um, the, the real information or the, the, the real climate that's happening there is to ask a few key questions around attrition, retention, promotability, and engagement survey results. And that'll give you a real clear indication of what type of work culture you're walking into. And if it's one where it's a work in progress, and you're okay with the work in progress and you want to be part of the catalyst to improve it and make it uh, more palatable, absolutely go for it. But at the end of the day, you always want to know what you're entering and what you're in for. And that's what's really important. Also, individuals have had certain um, trauma that triggers in certain cultures. And you have to also understand what that is. That's another great reason to have a mental health professional working with you because they can absolutely give you guidance on what type of culture will complement um, your background and what type of culture will be absolutely toxic for you and take you back several steps. Mm -hmm. um, so that, those are really important pieces to know about organizations. And most organizations now are immersed in some type of culture assessment, whether it's an intercultural um, competency index, whether it's a forte communication, or whether it's uh, working with engagement organizations such as Spring International or Gallup, um, they are absolutely looking at how to make their cultures better. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm embarking with one of my clients on a new um, culture index is called Holistic Index. And what it looks at is just, it looks beyond solely engagement. And it looks at engagement from a multitude of perspectives. One would be your benefits, your compensation, um, your relationship with your leader, um, the type of work culture you feel you're part of, flexible work schedules, 
um, and also any ancillary benefits that the organization doesn't have that you think would be important. One of those benefits right now is student loan um, assistance. So a lot of millennials are in the workplace and they would prefer to have assistance with their student loans than putting a lot of funds in 401k right now. And maybe there's ways organization can split that up. So what the Holistic Index is doing, which is uh, created by Tom Alexander, who in the Chicagoland area was the COO for um, 1871, which is, our, which is Chicago's technology hub here um, in downtown Chicago, is it's really given organizations almost like a credit score for the culture that they have. And when you think of a credit score, most people are always thinking about it, working on improving it, or making sure that they keep the muscle to maintain whatever it is, if it's a good score. And so all of those things feed into our mental health and wellness. Because if you have an employee that is worried about how they're going to make minimum payments on various bills, That's they're true. not financially healthy, they're not going to be the best proponent to take care of your customers internally or externally. So we are all beings of, that are multifaceted and we all have work life issues that are very dynamic, that takes us outside of just the workplace, that impact us, though, while we're in the workplace. So it's really important, and organizations are understanding that they're, they need to take a real 360 uh, view of employee, the employee experience and look at an employee beyond what they're doing just in the organization, but look at an employee as an a whole human being that has a life outside of work. One thing that is very interesting is that if employers did this assessment and they got this quote unquote cultural credit score, then I can decide <laughs> whether or not I want to work for that company based on how well they do or how poorly they do on this credit score. Because a lot of times we leave a job for money, right? We want to advance mm -hmm. our career. Then we get into a toxic environment in which there's individuals within that environment that want to keep us where we are. So yes, we went up a level, but we really, in five years, we've gone back a level because we can't move. We can't do anything in that environment. And our mental health is bad. Our, our hair is falling out. You know, all of this different stuff. And we're trying to figure out how to navigate that and get ahead. And if there was something that could tell me beforehand that the culture there is not conducive to working with um, people of color or people with, you know, that need accommodations or any of these other people, then maybe I wouldn't go there to work. I would just stay where I am, where they treat me well for a little while longer. And I think, you know, we need stuff like that. But I also think employees, employers wouldn't want to like disclose that as well. Exactly. And so there's other external organizations that provide information as well on uh, CEO, um, uh, how much employees are aligned with the CEO and the CEO sets the vision for the company. So if there's no alignment there, usually there's a systemic of a larger problem. And so when you look at an uh, organization like Glassdoor and they give kind of those scores around employee satisfaction, would they recommend their friends go work there? Are they aligned with the CEO? And it actually gives real stats and real salaries that people uh, tabulate into there. That's another way too, to kind of do some research on organizations. But what I will say is uh, about organizations that are struggling, because I've worked for several that are struggling, is that if you are part of an org organization that is struggling culturally, one of the things you want to look for is how the leadership is managing through that. Are they creating um, an environment and plans to address the issues? Because most organizations have something going on. They're not all perfect. But what makes an organization worth staying with versus maybe thinking of an exit strategy is your belief in the leadership team and their communication to you around what they're going to do to make it better. So when they get that credit score, what action plan are they effectively putting in place to address those issues that the employee has, 
have? And also, what's the timeline on those? Because if compensation is an issue and they're saying, well, we can't really address that for, for three or four years, then you have to step back and think, can you hold on that long? Right. Now, if the culture is toxic and you're also not being paid well, maybe it's not worth investing staying. However, if the culture is palatable, but you're just not paid as at market rate, you have flexible hours, the location is close to your home, um, your manager understands some of the um, extracurricular things you're doing, whether you decide to go back to school or whether you are very involved with a lot of your children's activities, then you have to think about yourself as once again, you have to think of you as a whole being as well as mm -hmm. the organization has to think of you as a whole being. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's not worth it to leave one organization to go to another for an incremental increase if it's going to increase your travel time, if you're paying more in gas, if you leaving an informal environment where most of your clothes you can throw in the laundry versus now you have to put those suits in, a, in the dry cleaners. Those are all things we have to think about that add to our stress levels. And yeah. stress is real and is coming out in, on individuals in a lot of different ways yeah. around, like you said, particularly for African-American women is hair loss. Yes. It's eczema. It's a and, lot of and, other pieces. Anxiety, weight gain. I mean, we can go down the list. That's and and uh, yeah, and insomnia, yeah. right? Yeah. You can't yeah. even sleep that, at night. That have anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. depression, all of that um, is really impacting Black women, and and it's impacting us in a way because we are considered to be strong, and we're not seeking the help either when these things begin to arise. And we don't even know right. how to seek the help. But you mentioned something recently. You said that if the employer would share these things with you, transparency is key. Transparency is key. If they would share what their vision is, what their plan is, and how you fit within that role, then you can make an educated decision on whether it's your time to stay or leave, right? Um, and I think... Absolutely. And Right. Absolutely. And I think there's certain triggers when you when you're even meeting with individuals from teams and interviewing that things you look for, um, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're going there on a full time basis. And I will tell you um, one client that that uh, I met with one of the team members said she spent a lot of her time working with leaders, trying to convince them that the projects that she was working on for them were viable and were worthy of their time. That let me know that wasn't where I wanted to spend my time because right. I, I need to go into scenarios where the leader is already on board. And yeah. if I'm spending my time as a consultant trying to um, have you buy into why I'm there, then that's not the best use of my time. And so you can get triggered. People give you cues. <laughs> Uh, that you either pick up or you choose to dismiss, but they definitely give you cues about the culture if you listen and if you hone in correctly. Well, we, we are almost out of time. We, um, I just want to finish up. We had a comment about ACE. ACE, for those who don't know, is Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it's not just affecting families in Chicago. I'm from Detroit, <laughs> where it's affecting people. It's affecting our nation right now. Mm -hmm. Like, curiously, it's affecting our nation because we just saw children be separated from their parents at the border. So I think that all of this stress with the government and stuff is coming into the workplace. And I'm so glad that you guys brought up ACE. But I really think that we need a whole nother discussion to really address adverse childhood experiences in, in a deeper way and to even talk about workplace positioning on that. So we are going to table that discussion. I thank you guys for bringing it up because I do think it's important. I hope you guys got some information. It looks like our, our clarity and everything cleared up all of a sudden. That was great. <laughs> Did and anyone we, have any more questions you want to type into us before eight o'clock? Yeah, because right now, and it's 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> For those on the Eastern Standard Coast, it's 9 o'clock. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to type them. If it's something that we won't address today, we have some good news to tell you that we will be around. We will continue to be able to address these issues and have these type of discussions because 
we are launching. You want to tell them? Where we're launching? You can, you can, it, yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> we are launching our new podcast. It's called The Total Knockout. It'll be available this fall. And so we are going to continue discussing these type of issues, issues that affect our nation, our community, our people. Um, and so we're going to dig deeper into this. Um, so if you have specific topics that you want to talk and, about. And, and, <laughs> and for those that are wondering what, what total knockout really means, it's uh, Dr. Tanja and Dr. Key. And so we're TKO. And I, I did see um, a question about what do we do if we have a bully at work? One of the things I find if you have a bully at work, once again, it's different levels to it. So if the bully is your manager, there's a certain way to address it. If the bully is a peer, there's a certain way to address it. I think um, either way, because I think the bully uh, personality is the same, whether they're leading or peers. However, there's a difference in political landscape and the impact that they can have on your career if it's your manager versus your um, peer. Yeah. So if it's a manager, what I always try to do with managers that, that are bullies is usually they are trying to bully you about one or two specific things. So one of the best ways to address that is to always have an action plan. You have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them weekly or bi-weekly. Prior to those meetings, create an agenda around what you are going to discuss. After the meeting, have a level set around what was actually discussed and send that in a memo format. Because what that does is it diffuses the bully from creating a story that's not there. Yeah. Um, and it also puts you in a position of having your stuff together, right? And being able to say, this is what I discussed. This is what we agreed upon. This is our working contract, so to speak. Yes, and it, it gives accountability to both parties. Absolutely. 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 Um, if the bully is your peer, I think there's some different avenues you can take as well. I, I'm just very transparent. So I'm the type of person who will just pull you aside, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, diffuse the conversation by taking out emotion, sticking to facts. Facts include date, time, incident, right? Take the feelings and emotion out, stick to the facts, and have the conversation and defuse the bully. I think one of the things that fuels a bully's fire is to see you cry. So whenever I see a person cry in a meeting with a bully, I'm just like, it's gonna get worse now. Because now they know your trigger. Yeah. And now they know Never. that you get a reaction out of you that's going to make them feel really good. Yeah. So whatever you do, clench your fists together, uh, cross your fingers under your thighs, whatever it takes. Do not cry in front of a bully because do the it just church, makes them do worse. The church they feel they empowered. Do the church finger and say, hold on a minute, step on out the room. Do not let them see you cry. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, I, I need a, a restroom break. I need a moment. Yes, I need a moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Thanks. this is TK here and you can feel free to reach out to us. We're on Facebook. Or you can reach out to me at reimagineod at gmail.com. You can reach out to Dr. Key as well. At thedrkey.com. So we, this is it for tonight. But please know that we will be back with some all new information, all new content. We will be sharing all the updates of the launch of the TKO podcast. And it is the Total Knockout. Um, we are from two different perspectives, but uh, two different fields. <laughs> but we're both black women. I grew up in Detroit, one in Chicago. So you're going to get some interesting dialogue from us both. Um, and so yes. please stay tuned. And thank you guys for joining tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Toya. Thank you, Dia. Thank you, Tracy.